Welcome to Live with the Author, Bridge Research to Practice. This is Reading Research Quarterly's new series of Skype interviews. And we have today here with us one of our fantastic authors, Dr. Richard Fisher. Welcome, Rick. Hi. Fantastic. And I'm Amanda Goodwin. I'm one of the co-editors of Reading Research Quarter Quarterly. And today we're looking forward to learning a little bit more about your article and thinking about what it means to actual practice. So Rick, can you tell us a little bit about how you got into this research? Sure. Um, so uh, I, I want to say first that I come into literacy um, sort of doubly as an outer, I feel like, or at least in, in terms of what often is the center of literacy. So I come from a composition and rhetoric background, which means that primarily I think about literacy on the production of text side rather than on the reading side. Um, and then also most of my work has been at the college level, working with college level writers in academic and professional writing settings. And so um, really this project is a dissertation project. I just finished my um, dissertation last fall and this was an early piece of that project. Um, and really came about because as I started to learn more about disciplinary literacy and think about uh, how I wanted to play in that space, um, I felt like something didn't really smell right. And, and um, so that's really the, the, the initial point of this is feeling like there's something about the way that we're talking about disciplines when we talk about disciplinary literacy that, that feels sort of weirdly um, uh, in, incomplete or, or sort of um, unclear. So that's, that's really what the initial point of this, uh, of this work was. Interesting. So it seems like kind of coming in with that outside perspective really helped you think about what you could add and how you could get it more complete and more um, thorough. Can you tell us a little bit about your study and what it found? Yeah, so it's um, I should say that my article is a theoretical piece, and so it's not uh, it's not findings in the traditional research sense. So I'll talk about what the takeaways, uh, what I think the, the really big takeaways are. Um, one is uh, as I started to look more into how we've been defining this, I do feel like um, I'm confirmed in the sense that we're we're. Um, that there is some kind of definitional imprecision around the relationship of discipline and content area and subject area and field, that, that those three things are, um, you know, being used in, in sort of interchangeable ways and not always. Sometimes people make a clean distinction and sometimes they don't. So that's an important thing that I think we should. So just um, to pause you there, discipline specific, content area and field, were those the big terms that you were thinking yeah. about? Yeah, so discipline and then subject or content area and then field. So those are three different ways that we sort of talk about sort of the areas in which we work or the areas in which we want to develop students' understanding or knowledge. Um, so an example of a discipline would be? So in my article, um, what I talk about is the way that in uh, English language arts, uh, that's sort of considered a subject or content area. Um, and for me in composition, having come from a literature background as an undergrad, um, I mean, people joke about going to composition as sort of going over to the dark side. And so there's a recognition that those are two different um, either fields or disciplines uh, that, that often at the K-12 level get collapsed into a single subject or content area. So that's an example of the kind of way in which um, our language for talking about what we mean by disciplinary literacy, I think, um, doesn't always align. Does that, is that a and fair that's, answer? Yeah, absolutely. And would you, when you're thinking about composition, are you thinking about it sort of in the layman's term of writing? Or is there a distinction between composition and writing? Uh, so I would say that uh, for me, composition is sort of the big umbrella for a variety of ways of thinking about writing. Um, and I would say that composition, the field of composition studies, has gone through a similar um, uh, evolution to literacy where there used to be sort of a more restrictive notion of what it meant to be a writer. And then as we started thinking about uh, how writing works and as we started to gain more information as we went through a sort of social constructivist moment, moment um, that that definition got much, much bigger. Uh, and so I think now to talk about composition um, is similar to the way that we talk about literacy as being about much more than just talking about reading. Uh, does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So it's kind of like a big umbrella term for writing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. 
So you were saying that you found in your study that these terms were kind of imprecise and being used sometimes for the same thing, sometimes differently. I, I think that uh, for me that's problematic because uh, it seems like then we, we sort of agree to perpetuate um, at the K-12 level a set of four things that we're calling the foundations of disciplinary literacy at those levels that are math, uh, science, history, and English language arts. Um, but then as students move on past that, things get much more complicated. And, I, and I'm, I'm unsure why those are our foundations. Um, I, and I wonder if there are other foundations that we could have uh, if we were more willing to push against uh, some of these ways that we seem to not question those relationships. Cool. And so one of the things you suggested in your study um, when I was reading it was that genre could really help us. At, so again, as both uh, reading and writing have come to understand themselves in much more um, social constructivist ways, um, or the, that there's been an awareness that the context of doing and knowing um, is part of reading and writing, um, I think that those fields are, are growing together, and yet it seems like there's a lot of work uh, in composition that is relatively unfamiliar to uh, literacy scholars. And so, right, genre um, and genre-oriented activity theory, uh, to me, I think are a way of trying to figure out um, how might we think about uh, disciplinary literacy in a way that's focused on the doing of the disciplines, um, maybe on the front end rather than on the way to on the way to knowledge. So, so what's your takeaway message for teachers? What can teachers use in your study to improve their instruction? One of the ideas that I suggest in my article is that um, activity is always, if we think about literacy from an activity theory perspective, um, that activity is probably always uh, Paul Pryor's term is laminated. So there are always these layers of activity that are sort of overlapping and competing with one another. Um, and if that's the case, then the goal of disciplinary literacy, um, I think, is often at odds with uh, schooling activity. So all of the effort of, of what we do to get grades and give grades. Um, uh, and, and so I think that a teacher can do a certain kind of disciplinary literacy instruction, um, but there are other disciplinary experts who probably can also provide um, other positions or can be um, providing access to other layers within that laminated activity. And so the question there for teachers is, who else can help um, to give students or help to understand the work of the discipline, right? So if this, if this falls entirely on teachers, um, then that's one perspective within a discipline, um, but it's not the only perspective. Um, one possibility is as students are um, being asked to engage in disciplinary tasks, um, trying to bring in people from um, places that are not primarily located in school activity. So, uh, you know, bringing in engineers as students are working on some kind of engineering project. Uh, so one of the terms I've started to use, I think that there's a tendency in, in some disciplinary literacy scholarship and pedagogy to sort of centripetalize, um, to, to, to sort of suggest that disciplinary literacy always sort of aims towards a central point. Um, and I think that the more that we can help students understand that people working at different spots within a discipline uh, are doing things differently, um, I think that that's a way to push against that sort of centripetal, uh, centripetal um, notion. Um, so, so the yeah. idea that within the like larger science discipline, engineers and chemists and doctors are all doing things different, or is the idea even that within the engineering discipline, you know, mm -hmm. somebody who is working on building a robotic leg is doing something completely different than somebody who is designing a computer learning environment, for example? Absolutely, right. So, um, yeah, the idea that not just within uh, what we call right now science literacy, which is bringing together really, really disparate, uh, what I would consider disciplines. Um, it's not just that, but also even if we're looking within disciplines, um, 
to see that people working at different spots within those disciplines are acting in different ways, are choosing different types of literacies, are are knowing and doing um, and making use of their information in different ways because of the motive, right? So the activities uh, systems part of um, my article is really focused on what's the activity motive and how does that drive the choices that we make um, rather than assuming that activity and motives are the same across an entire discipline. Mm -hmm. So that's really interesting. So, I mean, it sounds like takeaway messages for teachers is to keep this broader view of mm -hmm. discipline, uh, but then also to link it up to activities and to really think about the different ways that um, different people within a discipline are doing the doing. Interesting. So what would you say to principals and to policymakers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that, uh, again, from this idea of laminated activity, uh, the idea that schooling is its own type of activity and that we have created a bunch of expectations about what it means to be a good schooler or schoolgoer, um, I think that often that works at odds with the type of disciplinary um, activity that we might want to promote from a disciplinary literacy standpoint. Uh, and so for both principals and policymakers, I think that my question is how how can we – and I don't know if reduce is the right goal, uh, but how can we reduce some of those expectations um, of traditional school going? This is, I think, traditional assessment models. It's uh, standardized uh, assessment. Um, those are part of traditional school going. Um, and I wonder if there are ways that we can uh, or that we need to actually uh, back off on those or, or try to redirect those um, so that the motives of disciplinary activity can can drive the doing. Um, as you know, and as lots and lots of teachers know, uh, that's really, really hard when the system has so much momentum um, and there's so much expectation from students and parents um, and uh, policymakers for that system to continue. But it does, seem, it does seem like a takeaway message is to like really think about what are our outcomes? What do we want? kids to be doing and learning and how are we assessing that and as you mentioned standardized that tests are in one bubble but the actual activity the actual disciplinary process so for example if they're learning about engineering and they're learning about build, bridge building perhaps it's their bridge that they produce perhaps it's their learning to create the bridge that we're able to assess and think about um, so it seems like creating a more broad picture of yeah, I, I think, I mean, another place where I think that um, the traditional goal in, in schooling has been to try to assess people individually um, for their knowledge. Uh, if, if you look at discipline, certainly individual knowledge is important, but that's almost always getting um, integrated within larger collaborations of, of knowing and doing. And so that's a place where I think um, you know, that's a place where we might push differently and say, can we think about what it means for, uh, you know, a bridge to get built uh, as a successful group project um, that doesn't require me to then, you know, put students individually against a, a norm or expectation for assessment. Yeah, that's, that's a fascinating thought. So sort of thinking about the learning via the community, the product via the community. Um, mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, what do you have to say to parents regarding your findings? What, is, what should we be thinking about as we're working with our children? I think they're the uh, one. I, I think, um, you know, hopefully most parents are, are doing this already. But I think the question there is, how can you talk more about the work that you do? Um, and how can you explain that not just as a set of knowledge, um, but as a, as a way of doing? Right. What is the complexity of the work that you do? And I think that just ta again, so it's how, how can we expose students to more ways of understanding the complexity of doing in um, professional settings and disciplinary settings and beyond? Um, and and so I think that, uh, again, tr trying to help provide access to um, your own experience as a parent in in various kinds of doing. Um, and I think there, you know, I think again, disciplinary literacy can be sort of alienating to people who uh, maybe don't have advanced degrees. And I think that that is, um, that's sad because people in all fields and in all jobs have really complex knowledge about how to do their job. And I think that recognizing that and talking to students about that is, um, or, or to children about that is really important. Yeah, absolutely. So what's next for you? Where do you, where are you going next? Yeah, so, 
what I would like to do is try to take on this question of defining disciplines more directly. I think that there are lots of other people that have done really sophisticated work in a, in a lot of different fields trying to come up with a definition for dis a discipline, and I think it's really elusive and complex. Uh, but it seems like um, if disciplinary literacy is going to continue to be a way that educators think about um, that component of the work that they want to do. Um, I think pushing for a, a, a more nuanced um, definition of discipline is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that that's what I'm taking away from your work as well is, you know, really thinking about each discipline, not just the four that you talked about, you know, English language arts, math, science, and history, but even history as being very nuanced, even as each field within history as being very nuanced, and kind of exposing kids um, very purposefully to the different ways that people are doing. And part of that doing seems like it's talking, writing, and reading um, in those various fields. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's been wonderful to chat with you, Rick. We appreciate it. And we are looking forward to your next work. And if you're interested in Rick's article, you can find it on the Reading Research Quarterly website. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity to talk about this, Amanda. It's been fun.